Coach Brett Contreras and uh, this video is going to address butt wink in the squat and uh, I've got Skelly here with me. Um, now this is uh, not a, the best uh, anatomical model of a skeleton. I actually got it at Costco uh, just knowing that I would need to use it for a video one day. So I've had this guy for a couple months but never used him uh, until now. So. So this is Skelly, he's going to help out here. Um, so first let me describe what butt wink is. You know, we in the field call it butt wink, but it, butt wink really refers to his posterior pelvic tilt. So I have Skelly set up in the front squat position. He's going to be going down into a squat, okay? And as he goes down, there comes a point where the pelvis will begin to posteriorly tilt like this. It will posteriorly rotate and it pulls the lumbar spine with it into flexion. And so if you were to look at as he's going deep into the squat, his femurs are rising up like this. He would get to a point where he ran out of hip range of motion and from here forward going deeper would just be posteriorly tilting of the pelvis and rounding of the low back and this is dangerous so we always say keep an arch when we say keep an arch this means keep the spine like this don't let it round like that so you don't want too much rounding at the bottom of the squat because you've got uh, a bar on your back that's pushing down uh, that creates compressive force on the spine but what most people don't realize about the spi spinal loading is most of the compressive force is created by muscles. You've got abdominal muscles that connect, you've got erector muscles that connect, and they, when they contract, picture a muscle squeezing together, it's going to clamp down on that spine and compress it. So when you've got compressive force and you have that natural lordotic curve, you can withstand a lot of forces, but round over and do the same thing and you're risking herniations and things like that and, and damaging certain ligaments. So you really want to control this when you go down in a squat you want to keep this arch like this and you don't want the pelvis to rotate too much. Now here's the thing about theory and working in the field. Um, when, when I squat um, I can come down I get to about right here, and this is where I start to lose my tilt. From here, I can keep this nice solid arch. When I go deeper, I start to lose it. So that last few inches of range of motion is where I lose my solid lumbar extension and my anterior pelvic tilt. However, it's not, it's not a problem. I can squat like this month, week in, week out, month in, month out, year in, year out, and it doesn't cause a problem because it's not too much lumbar flexion. It's not too much posterior pelvic tilt. So I get so many emails where people say, well, Brett, you know, first of all, how, how do I know if I'm having too much butt wink or too much posterior pelvic tilt or lumbar flexion at the bottom of the squat? And this is where the art of coaching comes into play because you just, as a coach, I've seen it for so many years, you just know. There are some guys I've seen, the worst case, was a guy in uh, Auckland that I that I used to train with. He would get to about, I'd say, when he squatted, he would get to about right here, and he would start to lose his, he wouldn't even be close to parallel, and he would start to round. And he'd go like this, and he'd start to round over. Um, if you can get past parallel to here and keep this arch, and then right about here you start losing it, and it's just a little bit, then it's okay. So some, some amount is acceptable, but excessive is too much. You've got a little bit of wiggle room in the lumbar spine, but not much. And that's, again, where the art comes into play, because I just know it when I see it, and it's hard to explain, you know, if they're using 20% of their lumbar spine flexibility, it's not as big of a deal if they're going to full lumbar flexion, and you just know it when you see it. But the other question I get is, how do you improve it? So I want to explain some things about, uh, about the human body here. So 
All right. Most everyone thinks it's a, it's a matter of increasing flexibility. So they will they rationalize that if I go once I get to here, I run out of flexibility in certain muscles and I have tight hip flexors, tight hamstrings or whatever people think is tight and this is causing me to round over. I need to, you know, it's these tight muscles are pulling and it's causing me to round over and I need to stretch those muscles. But let me explain some things real quick. Um, it's more likely due to one's particular, and again, this is not the best model of the human body, but you can see that the hip is a ball and socket joint. So when I, ideally it would you'd be like this skeleton where you could just, you know, well not ideally, because if you could go back to here that would be problematic. But the point is, you'd want good hip flexion and hip extension mobility and you wouldn't be most restricted. But as you can see in this model, I get to a point here, I have no more hip extension unless I really jar things. And so people have a natural hip flexion, uh, you know, a point at where it kind of stops. And it's the way that the head of the femur articulates with the acetabulum here in the hip socket. So if you get to a point where this stops, it will pull. I can't go any further this way, so the only way to go deeper is by, you know, continuing to round the pelvis and round the lumbar spine with it, because I can't go any more here. And this depends on your own anatomy. So some people who have good anatomy can go deeper, maybe they can get to here, and some people can only go to here. So most of this is due to anatomy. It's anatomical in some cultures like Asians, for example, are notorious for being able to squat real deep. And they keep that because they, they do that in their daily lives. They squat a lot when they eat and things like that. And then other cultures, um, they, for example, you might, may have heard of the Scottish hip um, or the Celtic hip. It's just common for like Northern Europeans to have, you know, deeper hip sockets and they might run out of flexibility right before parallel. So the only way they're getting below parallel in the squat is to butt wink a little bit. Now, here's what's important for you to understand. People do improve their hip flexion mobility over time. People can improve their squat, their squat depth. And let me first explain why stretching isn't always the solution. People a lot of times talk about the hamstrings. Now, if you think about the hamstrings, um, they're the way they, uh, their attachment points, when I go down into a squat, okay, I am going to be shortening the hamstrings at the knee, but lengthening the hamstrings at the hip. And so the net result is that I don't get much length change. It might increase in length, the hamstrings might increase in length just a little bit, especially if you hold your anterior pelvic tilt, if the, if the pelvis is tilted properly. But when I go deep into a squat, it's not my hamstrings limiting my squat depth. It's not tight hamstrings that are preventing the hip from going deeper into flexion because they don't change length that much. All right, now think about the hip flexors. You've got, you know, the iliacus here. You've got the psoas here. So the iliopsoas, when I go into hip flexion, is actually shortening. It's not going to be lengthening. And if you think about the rectus femoris, the rectus femoris is going to be lengthening at the knee, but shortening at the hip. So just like the hamstrings, it's a biarticular muscle, meaning it crosses two joints. So just like the hamstrings, it's not going to change length much. So it's probably not the hip flexors that are, and this is probably the prevailing thought, is that butt wink is, is caused by tight hip flexors and you need to stretch your hip flexors and it's automatically going to cure your butt wink and you're going to have less posterior pelvic tilt. But that's probably not the issue either. Um, so stretching can help. I'm not telling you not to stretch, but what I am telling you is that motor control is imperative here. And let me explain this further. When you go down into a squat, all right, you've got a lot of muscles here that are going to be working, right? Okay. So 
you have the glutes, you've got the quads, you've got the hammies, you've got the adductors, you've got the erectors, you've got the abdominals, you've got all these muscles that are helping you squat. And as you gain proficiency, um, you become be a better squatter. Now, the first thing I will tell you is, see when this, when Skelly squats down, he goes deep into a squat. Look at how much ankle dorsiflexion mobility he has uh, here. His knees go way out. If you are limited in ankle dorsiflexion mobility, let's say you can only go to here. Your knees can only migrate forward that much because you have tight uh, ankle mobility, ankle dorsiflexion mobility. So he can't do this. So if he has to do this, look at what happens to his, if I, if I move the knee back like this, he would fall backwards. The only way to stay centered would be to round over more. So just tight, that shows you how just having tight uh, ankle dorsiflexors can cause people to round over. So that's the first thing that you need to improve is ankle dorsi dorsiflexion mobility or a lot of Olympic weightlifters have heeled shoes where it's like this. So now that same, see if I can only get to here but then I use heeled shoes, see how that shifts the knee forward and you can get more um, forward knee migration, some bodybuilders will stand on plates. So that might help solve the low back rounding. And that's not even addressing the hip, that's addressing the ankle. But let's assume you have good ankle dorsiflexion mobility. And you can go down deep. Here's what you need to know. Some muscles here pull on the head of the, they, they, they act on the head of the femur and they influence how it articulates in the, with the hip socket. So since the glutes uh, originate posteriorly to the uh, gluteal tuberosity and the IT band, when they contract, they exert a rearward pull. And this creates, it keeps the head of the femur suctioned into that acetabulum, and it creates some space for this to keep, to allow, because if you're jamming forward, you might, your hip flexion mobility might stop here. But if the glutes are working properly, it can pull rearward and allow some more space. So this is why having properly activating glutes is important. But it's not just the glutes, it's all the muscles acting in proper coordination. So motor control is kind of like, you can think of it as coordination. So you have stability, you have mobility, and you have motor control. Mobility is the ability of this, you know, um, of the joint to move through a range of motion. Stability is the ability of muscles to stabilize the, you know, the joints. But motor control is where it programs everything together. So motor control is your coordination. So as you descend into a squat and you have properly activating muscles, the hip flexors are working properly from this end. The adductors are working properly from this end. The quads are, you know, the, well, the erect, I already said that. The rectus femoris is part of the hip flexors is working properly. The glutes are working properly. The hamstrings are working properly. The hip rotators are working properly. And you've got everything, you know, the erectors and the abs are stabilizing the, the lumbar spine and pelvis. And then eventually your brain learns how to program it all together and suction that the, the, head of the femur in place and keep it centrating in that joint properly, which allows for greater depth. And so a lot of times uh, as you improve your squat, you, you gain experience with the squat and you gain coordination, you will improve your uh, hip flexion mobility and you will cure that butt weak. So it's not just, don't just stretch, you also have to practice Practice squatting, practice squatting with lighter weights, practice goblet squatting, and practice going deep, keeping that chest up and sinking down, and this will help improve your, your hip flexion mobility over time. Make sure you have good ankle dorsiflexion mobility, make sure you have good core stability, and, you know, and as you increase your hip mobility and, your, and you practice the squat more, you should be able to improve your squat depth over time without but winking without losing that spinal arch. However, please realize that it is very anatomically related. So not everyone is gonna be able to sink a rock bottom full squat. Um, and that's up to you to determine 
which is your best squat. So some people should probably only go to parallel. What's the point? Some people, some people might even not even be able to go to parallel. Um, and some people can go rock bottom. And that all depends on your anatomy and your goals. So I hope you've uh, enjoyed this video and that you've learned something. Thank you very much for watching.